Wisdom of Solomon chapter 6 verse 6 says, For the lowliest man may be pardoned in mercy, but mighty men will be mightily tested. St. John of Damascus comments on this, No one lacks the gifts of God entirely. This one is inclined to more excellent virtues and that person to humble and modest ones. God has given to each according to the measure of his faith. Therefore, the one entrusted with much will be examined more severely, since of him much will be required. Today, we are discussing Wisdom of Solomon, chapters 5 and 6. Let's get into it. I'm Joel Miller. And I'm Jamie Bennett. And this is Bad Books of the Bible. It's a podcast about a collection of books with a curious pedigree and an even stranger legacy. So far, we've seen the unjust and the just man contrasted here in the Wisdom of Solomon. The unjust get their comeuppance, and that begins at the end of chapter 4. In verse 20 of chapter 4, it says, They will come with dread when their sins are reckoned up, and their lawless deeds will convict them to their face. Mm. Chapter 5 just picks up exactly where that leaves off. The flow of thought is seamless, and you get right into this idea of the unjust being judged the righteous being saved and the the unjust the ungodly being shocked that the yeah. that the righteous are saved yeah and not and not just saved but like it says they're standing with great confidence uh right like right in the presence of those who've afflicted them so this is like not not only facing your accuser but facing your accuser with confidence which is kind of amazing because like over these last several chapters the the pile on on the godly is dramatic yeah. um everywhere they turn they're being persecuted and so for the reversal of fortune to be so sudden and so definitive that they stand in confidence while the unjust uh face the shock of their undoing is surprising yeah and you know it it's funny because it kind of turns from them sitting there mocking the godly uh mocking the wise and the ungodly kind of begin to you know bitch and moan i mean they're complaining bitterly they're right they're, uh so you you go from like uh, to take us back a little bit but uh like in chapter two we see them really taunting the godly uh they right. and they're inviting him, them to enjoy the pleasures of this life um to ignore well not exactly ignore the brevity of life but to see the brevity of life, not in a, an invitation to wisdom, but the brevity of life as a, well, then nothing matters. Right. And, and so enjoy the pleasures now rather than that, which is to come. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a shift uh, here, but we do have some more taunting. Well, we do. I, I'll tell you what's fun about this spot in the way that it turns for me personally, just reading it besides the content itself is the flavor of the language. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fascinating to read this book. You can read it on all kinds of different levels, but one of the levels you can read it on is the level of a stylist, just like how he says what he says, how the author incorporates other texts, right. how he, how he layers up meaning and allusions, how he plays with ideas from one chapter to the next. And some of the expressions and some of the ways he phrases things are just like arresting. There's this spot, for instance, in chapter five, where the, the ungodly have finally found, you know, they're, they finally reached their end. Mm -hmm. They finally have, uh, they're facing their, their judgment. And you get lines like this, um, all those things have vanished like a shadow and like a rumor that passes by, like a ship that sails through the billowy waters. And when it has passed, no trace can be found, no track of its keel in the waves. Or as yeah. when a bird flies through the air, no evidence of its passage is found. The light air lashed by the beat of its pinions and pierced by the force of its rushing flight is traversed by the moment, by the movement of its wings. And afterward, no sign of its coming is found there. Like, it's that's a beautiful <laughs> picture of of the of the fleetingness yeah. of of the things that you've tried to accomplish in your life. Yeah. They're they they appear to be there and then they're gone and there's like not a trace. Like Bob Dylan couldn't have written better lyrics than this. No. no. And 
What's interesting about, and by the way, I love Bob Dylan. So sure. um, what a great, what a great comparison, but yes, uh, you can actually imagine Dylan writing lyrics like that. Yeah. What's interesting is where um, the author is pulling some of that imagery from. Like for instance, the ship and the bird, that's a direct quote or nearly so from Job chapter nine, where it says, is any trace at all left of a way taken by ships or of an eagle flying in search of prey? There's yeah. this idea of the fleetingness of these things and it's there in Job and this author picks it up and develops it in a way that with like some real poetic beauty. And I mean, I was honestly just kind of stunned by that when I, when I realized what was happening in that yeah. language, I just thought that's, that's just arresting. Well, and, yeah, and well, there's more of it in this passage too. Yeah. So I, yeah, I was going to say also the chaff, you know, the straw that's blown by the wind yeah. uh, in verse 14, yep. we see that multiple places in the Bible and that the imagery of, of straw, that this thing that's basically utterly disposable. Um, right. This is picked up in Job and the Psalms and Isaiah. I, th I think it's in the new Testament even, you know? Yeah, totally. And what's, what, the, what the right what the unrighteous are experiencing here and we get in this kind of like flowery language is a recognition of the utter emptiness of their pursuits the things that were so elevated in their life before the thing that they held out over the un, uh, over the righteous over the godly now it's kind of like turned around on them and they're recognizing that they have nothing to show for all of that and there's this line even uh, that references the 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 ungodly talking about not taking the Lord's way, not following the Lord's way. Um, and and that path not taken is the path that the righteous have taken. And as a result, while in this life, everything seemed to go one way against them, it turns out, no, it actually was going for them. And and the reverse is true for the ungodly. So let's chat a little bit about the reward of the just. If you look at these uh, passages here, this passage, uh, there's a reference to like eternal life. There's uh, royalty. There is uh, a crown. They're shielded by God. What are some of the images and the takeaways from the, the pictures provided here on the the reward that the just receive? The thing I really liked was where it talked about the light of righteousness. It says, uh, the light of righteousness did not shine on us and the sun did not rise upon us. You know, it, and if you think about that, if the sun isn't rising upon you, where, what are you left in? You're left in darkness. Right. So this imagery is meant to be, you know, really contemplated and, and thought through. So the ungodly in this, in this scenario where they haven't repented, um, they're ultimately left in darkness. Um, yeah. They they don't have the son of righteousness. Uh, we we know throughout scripture that light can be uh, you know symbolic of knowledge of the law or or of you know understanding of God's ways that that the presence of God itself is light. Right. So so the symbol of the sun you know here kind of kind of seems to be an obvious connection to this use of light throughout scripture. Yeah. That um, that quote, the son of righteousness, that's also borrowed too, right? I think that comes from Isaiah as well. That's like, oh, yeah. like this author is so utterly familiar with his tradition that he's able to just weave these ideas throughout. And unless you're not aware of that, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't get it. But if you are, you're like, oh wow, look at that here and here and here and here yeah. and here. It's, it pops up everywhere. And if if I'm not mistaken, I mean, many of the holy fathers, uh, because they they saw so much of the Old Testament in light of Christ, um, mm -hmm. this son of righteousness would have easily been picked up by early Christians as referring to the coming of the Messiah. Um, totally, absolutely. And and I I think this phrase is also in uh, in Malachi. And Malachi definitely looks forward to a messianic, uh, messianic kingdom. Yeah. I might be wrong then. It may not be Isaiah at all. It may be Malachi. Well, I, I, I'm not sure. That's a homework assignment for us, I guess. <laughs> I guess so. All right. This idea of being shielded by God, back to these quotes. Um, here's another one. 
This is also out of Isaiah, Isaiah 59. Uh, it references God taking up the 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 plight of the of the godly and weaponizing creation against mm. the ungodly. And in that passage, it mentions God putting on righteousness as a breastplate, which if you're familiar with the New Testament, you remember the armor of God that that Paul talks about. That's also a callback to Isaiah, where it says the very same thing. If you're in Isaiah 59, you have this reference to God placing on a helmet of salvation uh, and clothing himself with a garment of vengeance. In Isaiah 59, there's this whole like apocalyptic vision of justice coming upon the ungodly for their treatment of the godly. And that passage is not only obviously in mind of the writer of Isaiah, he's using the exact language to call the reader's mind back to that also, because he's saying, remember the promises of God. They're not in vain. God will deliver you. And he's, instead of just like saying it blankly, he's using this poetic borrowing from the book of Isaiah to get that across. And you end up with like this, this picture of God, like arming himself, and going to battle on behalf of of his people. Now, what's yeah. interesting about that in terms of the scope of the book, remember, is that the author of the book is kind of addressing the kings of the world. Sure. And a king is supposed to do justice. A king is supposed to follow wisdom, et cetera, et cetera. That's not happening. And so what you see is those kings are, are being punished, are being disciplined, are being uh, chastised by the king by God. So if the kings will not do their work, God will do their work and God will bring about justice. And and this apocalyptic vision of that happening is taken right out of Isaiah, dropped right here to say all, all the fear that you have about being persecuted, about following the righteous way and yet not not uh, thriving in this world as a result of that, don't worry, God has your back. God will protect you. God will see to it that you are vindicated. And he's borrowing these texts from Isaiah to show that to yeah. the reader. So the reader knows, oh, yeah, this is what this is what's true and being reminded of that. Yeah. And, you know, for the Christian, I think it's it's not a big jump for us to go from this imagery of God putting on armor to seeing like the full armor of God that right. St. Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter six. Uh, and and specifically, you know, St. Paul says that we put on this armor so that when the day of the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Um, and and after you've done everything to stand. So it it's withstanding in the midst of this exceeding difficulty. And yeah. one, of, one of the reasons I wanted to connect this there is because this this concept of when the day of evil comes. Now, this could be. You, you, you know, we can look at putting on the full armor of God for our daily difficulties, but this eschatological, this apocalyptic end of all things that that God will uh, set all things to right, that, mm -hmm. that God will um, undo the injustices uh, yeah. like that is something that is part of Christian theology and and Jewish theology. Uh, you know, apocalyptic eschatology. So, you know, while, while we might, um, we might think of lyrics like thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Uh, that is the, the imagery <laughs> that's in this right. text, you know, the lightning bolts from heaven, the hailstones are falling floods and pestilence, right? Like it's, it's not supposed to necessarily be saying that all of this, uh, that God is going to strike the ungodly with a literal uh, lightning bolt um, on Tuesday, but that God will set things to right, that he is powerful and that he is even sovereign over the mightiest men and that the doings of the ungodly will be punished. You know, e evil will be dealt with. That idea of like... Um like cosmological uh like craziness happening like the world breaking apart um yeah that's all that's all figurative language the bible is using to describe the well-ordered 
you know, simple, like machine, like flow of things going smoothly in the world, like being rattled to the core, like this is God shaking things up and everything that you thought the pattern that you had developed the the way to make things go smoothly in your life and all of that like imagine these rulers so, sitting so self-satisfied on their thrones with all of their abilities and all of their might and all of their the tax income coming in and all their armies and everything else like this yeah god's saying none of that matters i'm going to shake it all down it's all coming apart and i'm going to do it um so you can have some like you can have some pride in that, but it's gone the minute you do. Yeah. And, and I want, sorry to keep going with lyrics, but you know, Johnny Cash is uh God's going to cut you down. Like right. that's definitely something in this text, but I think this, this text is also talking about the things that we do, the, right. the unwise actions we do that are the undoing of, of the totally. order in the world. And, and you look at the end of chapter five, it says lawlessness will lay waste the whole earth and evil doing will overturn the thrones of rulers. I mean, you don't have to spend much time looking at history to see how many rulers undid their, they, they were their own undoing by their right. actions. And, and so this is a very real warning that like our own lawlessness can lay waste to the whole earth. It's not just uh, God stepping in with that thunderbolt. It's also our actions can you know, essentially overturn our own lives. Yeah. To to go ahead and belabor song lyrics a little further. <laughs> um, Peter Tosh's song, Down Presser Man, Where Are You Gonna Run To? Like that absolutely echoes in my mind as you say that. And then to like reverse it and and use the, the scripture as a mirror and say, but where are you being the down presser man? Where are you uh, being lawless? That's that's humbling. That's yeah. like surprising. And of course, that's part of what the text is for, because it's not like the author of this book is actually presenting it to the kings of the world. And they're like actually reading it and they're actually saying, oh, my goodness, look at what I've done. I'm going to have to reform my ways. Right. The point right. of it is actually you and me. So the point of it, the real audience for this book is the average reader who picks this up and says, well, now what? I'm going to yeah. I'm going to follow the righteous path. And I'm going to suffer for that. Or I could opt to like short circuit all that, all that unpleasantness and, and join the other end of things. And in little compromises in my life, I do all the time. And, and the reminder here is no, you cannot do that because the lawless uh, lawlessness will wait, lay waste to the whole earth. But like, do you want to participate in that or not? Not. given everything up to this point right the author now he's gonna he's gonna shift he's gonna say okay now that i've kind of set the whole the whole thing in front of you like here's here's what wisdom looks like here's what following wisdom looks like mm -hmm. like can be negative here's what here's what following the lack of wisdom envy which is kind of the juxtaposition there here's what living an envious life looks like here's what living an unrighteous life looks like uh, it's not going to go well. It, you know, it may feel great on the front end. It's going to be bad on the bad end. Um, considering all of that, the author says, now let's reconsider wisdom. He's saying, now it's time to get serious and study this path. Because he's assuming that it's clear enough that you're yeah. going to make a right call. Yeah. You know, only a fool is going gonna, is gonna, to, at this juncture, choose willingly to, to live the life of the unjust. So if we're going to be just then what does it look like? That's yeah. that's where that's where the book goes next in chapter six. One of the cool things, uh, sometimes we talk on here about interesting variations related to the Latin Vulgate and things mm -hmm. related to Jerome. So uh, according to the Ignatius oh. Bible, this, uh, this chapter opens up in the Latin Vulgate with better is wisdom than power and better is a prudent man than a strong man. And it's very interesting because that, that, almost reads to me like maybe Jerome added a heading or something for this chapter that got incorporated into the right. Vulgate as part of the text. Because that seems to be part of the point that this chapter makes. But in verse one, uh, there's this 
almost classically biblical vibe going on here where it's listen therefore O kings and understand learn O judges of the ends of the earth uh as we've said before much of this uh much of this book is addressed specifically to kings and rulers um and but we've said it's applicable to us um so it's kind of like where the audience seeing this drama go on and now the kings are being called out again but ultimately we're intended to be the audience here so the the, our takeaway is not listen therefore O king so we don't have to listen no our takeaway is what this vulgate says better is wisdom than power better is a prudent man than a strong man well you know you do get a kingdom according to this very text if you are righteous, the, the, the reward of righteousness is a crown. The reward of righteousness is a kingdom. And so, I mean, in a sense, while this is written and you said this, this drama uh, between the author who's acting almost as a prophet yeah. and like challenging royalty, challenging the powerful. Um, while that drama is playing out to go back to the idea of internalizing that struggle for ourselves and using this as a goad to do the right thing, um, to follow wisdom. Uh, there, there's this promise that's given in the text right here also about, about following wisdom, producing not only eternal life, but also, uh, this uh, royalty of producing a crown. And so if you want to be worthy of the crown, the point is you cannot act like the rulers of the world. The rulers of the mm. world need to follow wisdom in order to be worthy of their crown. And any of us, we will receive the same crown. And you could look at it like a martyr's crown, too, because sure. that's, that's also part of this story. Um, but that reward comes from from following wisdom. And so this book, like you said, presents that drama and invites us into playing a role in that drama yeah i also want to point out that uh you know readers of other parts of the old testament might find familiar uh some of the imagery here and that we'll cover in uh the the next episode or two where in wisdom chapter six uh probably six through nine there's a lot of imagery from like proverbs one through nine where wisdom is like a woman um, she's in the city yep. gates, she's in the street, she's she's calling out to people and offering her counsel. And and so we'll we'll see that not just today, but we'll we'll see that in the future. But I thought that this was was a really interesting uh section because well, I I was thinking of my own life actually. So in uh verses 12 through 14, I remind I, I was reminded when I was like 22 or 23 and I would sometimes meet my girlfriend outside her dorm room in the morning with a with a coffee and like a card or something, you know. I mean, it was it was very young love, um, joy and enthusiasm. But when when you look at how it describes wisdom, it says that she is waiting for someone to come out to her, mm-hmm. and and so when. When I read that, I immediately thought of me standing outside that dorm room with the coffee. But this imagery is more like it would have been more like me getting up to head down to that dorm room. And I Mm -hmm. come out of the house and she's down at the end of my driveway and she's already waiting to meet me. Right. According to, to the wisdom of Solomon, wisdom is like that for us. When we go looking for her, she's ready. She's at the end of your driveway. She's at, at the gate. You know, and she's ready to meet you. And uh, as verse 16 says, she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. Who's the them? It's those who are worthy of wisdom, those who are seeking after wisdom. Yeah. yeah so song lyric. I mean, this is sting, right? <laughs> I'll be watching you. Um, every movie you make. So, wisdom gets creepy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know how much of a stretch this is, but. You know, this will just uh, echo something out of my own experience. I grew up in a in a Protestant church that was very Calvinistic in its outlook. And when you think about salvation, the idea is that God initiates and that man responds. Um, but the initiation part of that promise or that statement is given so powerfully 
that yeah. man is almost or nearly passive in in the experience and this passage presents a different kind of idea this passage presents a much more synergistic idea of how one pursues the life of god you pursue it by responding to the call of wisdom but it's a very active response there is nothing passive about the acquisition of wisdom about what we could say is the acquisition of salvation in this passage you have to like get up and get going and if you don't get up and get going you do not encounter wisdom because while she is there to meet you you have got to go meet her like they are there's a synergy there no i i think you're exactly right that's it i think uh the catholics call it like provenient grace that there there is this grace that has come to us this wisdom has already come to us it's accessible but Mm -hmm. we have to be the ones who who desire it uh, we, we see later in this chapter, it says that the beginning of wisdom, uh, which, you know, we all know is the fear of the Lord, right? But uh, this text says the desire to be instructed. And so yeah. th- the desire to be instructed itself is called uh, evidence of love for wisdom, that it's that it's itself is love and that love is found in following wisdom or keeping her laws. And yeah. then that is like, it's like this chain of, of things that are connected and that um, giving heed to the laws, there's a promise attached yep. and that promise is immortality. And, yep. and then that chain is chained to what does immortality do? It brings one near to God. So right. in conclusion, and there's one more after that too, right? Yeah. The desire for wisdom leads to, you said it earlier, ultimately a kingdom, a kingdom. And, and this, there's this idea here. I, I love what the author's doing here. They're make, they're doing this syllogism where they're just like, this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this, leads mm-hmm. to this, leads to this, and that they're ultimately getting to the therefore, and the therefore is the wisdom uh, that wisdom leads to a kingdom. The desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom, and that again parallels or stands in juxtaposition, better to say, with the kings of the earth to whom the book is formally addressed. Because what he's saying here is that, like, if you want to be the king, this is actually the path. The Mm -hmm. path is wisdom. The path is God's path. The path is the path that the ungodly say point blank in chapter five that they have disregarded. That's what he's calling them to follow here. There's a line that you started with at the top of the show that I wanted to come back to. Um there's a reference here to the mighty will be mightily tested. And I think the the thing to keep in mind there is that these Kings, you and me also Mm -hmm. like to whatever extent we have power, to whatever extent we have resources, to whatever extent we have wherewithal, we will be judged in proportion to that wherewithal. We will be judged in proportion to that might. And, you know, we, you know, forget about song lyrics for a minute, go straight to comic books. This is uncle Ben, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) And, and that idea is baked into the fabric of the universe is what this book is telling us Mm, that if you have, if you have resources, you will be called to account for those resources, which is why he's so harsh on these Kings. But of course we have our own version of this and we have to be mindful of that too. Let's also redirect this back to what you were saying about wisdom seeking us out and our need to respond. Mm -hmm. This idea of seeking and finding, like this parallels the gospel. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will Mm -hmm. be opened unto you. This Mm -hmm. idea that if you are not as, if you are not a participant in this enterprise, that is the, the Christian life, that is the life of God, that is the life of holiness, it won't happen for you. Like the, the kingdom isn't there for people that aren't knocking on the door. The kingdom isn't there for those who are not seeking. And that's the same with wisdom. And they're all, I mean, this is all, we should all see this as a piece. This is all one thing. And this is God basically holding out two paths. And he's saying, go for this one. And the, this one is one that you have to actually step on that path and act and actively walk.
as we've been pointing out, many of these texts connect with other parts of scripture and over and over, mm -hmm. we've seen them connect back to the Psalms. And you mentioned to me off air that there's a connection between Psalm 37 and the wisdom of Solomon. Right. This is interesting to me because Psalm 37 has been one of my favorite Psalms for about as long as I can remember, at least since I was a kid. Uh, when we say Psalm 37, we mean Psalm 36 in the Septuagint. So depending on sure. what altar you're following, Psalm 37 or Psalm 36. That's, yeah, important clarifier. And part of the reason this text was so special to me was I remembered my mom saying to me that she would pray through this psalm. Now, my family mm -hmm. was going through some difficult things at the time. And this psalm brought her comfort and gave words um, to her prayer or to her feelings. It, it basically helped her create a prayer uh, to express what she was experiencing. And she she drew a lot of comfort from this text. As a young, impressionable kid, I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. Like my mom's using the Bible to pray. Like, right. And I was not from a liturgical tradition, so we didn't do this sort of thing a whole lot. Uh, so I, I yeah. remember even, at, I think it was church camp that I first started praying through this. I had a Bible and nothing to do. So, you know, I broke it open and and started praying through it. And it just really stuck. And for my whole life, this has been a psalm that I go back to again and again. So I'm curious, Joel, can you unpack the connections between Psalm 37 and Wisdom of Solomon? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the reason why you resonate with it is the same reason you resonate with the Wisdom of Solomon, and that it's it's the same message. If you think about the parallel here, Psalm 37 is like the experience of the righteous person going through this world where the wicked seem to prosper and they're on your case and and maybe you're persecuted and you're suffering as a result of being of trying to follow a righteous path mm -hmm. and what th that experience is captured in psalm 37 but the explanation of it is captured in the wisdom of solomon so it's like these two passages, or these two books, these two sections of scripture are parallel to each other. They're doing slightly different things, but they're doing it about the same thing. Sure. One is capturing this experience and the other is explaining. And you can just see, just like skim this book and you can see it right at the very beginning. Psalm 37, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Refrain from anger. And forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil, for the evildoer shall be cut off. Now you flip that and you get, turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. This idea of immortality being the response or the, the reward, rather, for leading a godly life is right there. And mm -hmm. that is picked up exactly that way, including like the idea of, of dwelling forever right there in that little chain of references you just mentioned in wisdom of solomon it's there are echoes throughout both uh, throughout the whole thing where like one is leading to the other and it's pretty obvious that the author of the wisdom of solomon knows this book knows yeah. this psalm i should say and because he knows this psalm he's able to pick up like the experiential side and then turn it to his explanatory purposes so he's hitting the very same themes, yeah. but he's doing it with the with the role of explicating it for you. So he's like, he's going to basically say, you know, all those feelings you have they're you know, they're captured there in Psalm 37. Let me explain what's happening with that. Why do you feel that way? Why are you provoked to envy? And notice that in the wisdom of Solomon, envy is held up as the opposite of wisdom. So mm -hmm. if you see mm -hmm. the unrighteous prospering, it's easy to think if I were like that, I would have that. It's not right that they have that. I should have that. I should be the one who has that. All of a sudden now you are literally reading from the devil's playbook. This is the way, this is like the, this is what brought death into the world in the first place is envy. And, and Psalm 37 is warning you against it. And the wisdom of Solomon holds that up as the antithesis to wisdom in order to point out the starkness of that choice you have got to go this direction not this other direction if you do you will be ruined and if instead you go the right direction you'll prosper ultimately prosper yeah and it's uh, it's not lost on me that the similarities in the in the text there because you see in verse two 
like the grass they wither they die you know they fade away so you you have this same imagery of yep. the straw and the chaff and then ultimately it's the righteous who are rewarded in the daylight where everybody can see you know psalm right. 37 verse 6 says your vindication like the noonday sun yep it's amazing good connection yeah i i think just one of the great things about the wisdom of solomon is how rich the read is so even if you don't even really know what to do with this book like let's say you're from a tradition that has never bothered to look at this book it's not mm -hmm. part of your it's not part of your world fine just pick it up and read it and what you will see is that there are layers upon layers upon layers of God's wisdom and revelation here that will challenge and inspire and certainly convict as some of these passages do today, like we talked about, like driving us to make the right choices on a daily basis to pursue wisdom in such a way that we actually encounter wisdom and, and meet it at the end of the driveway, so to speak. Yeah. You know, one thing we totally forgot to talk about. Tell me, Joel. Well, this book is the all these first like six chapters. They're entirely written in third person. It's this person oh, and that person, right? right? But there's a weird little shift that happens in chapter six, where there's a yeah. reference to quote my words. Who is this my? Well, we oh my kind of mentioned it. At the last podcast, at the tail end, and I totally forgot to come back to it this time, but it's Solomon. He's he's like peeking out from behind the curtain here, and he's <laughs> he's revealing himself as the author of the book, so to speak. The character of Solomon, though, comes out here. Yeah. And what you'll really find is that after that little peek, he comes on like full bore in chapter seven. So... Yeah. That first peak, though, happens in chapter six, where he's where he refers to my words. And then you're like, well, who is this my? And yeah. I'm so glad you asked because it's coming. It's it's almost like we've been setting up the the main guest who's going to come in right. and let us know uh, through his great oration. Ultimately, what this is all about. This is like the Jayhawks opening up for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, right? <laughs> so we just got through the Jayhawks. Now it's time for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Nice. Thanks for tuning in this week. If you found this study helpful, please visit badbooksofthebible.com where you can sign up for various things, follow us various places, and tell various friends about our show. I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. And you've been listening to Bad Books of the Bible. A production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next week when we get a little bit more serious about finding out what Solomon has to say. 